Blake from the University of Pennsylvania. And I'm very happy to be here today to have the opportunity to talk to you about the impact of telluric lines on EPRV measurements. Now I'm sure we can all agree that Earth's atmosphere is wonderful and that provides a nice place for us to live here on Earth and generates beautiful sunsets like the one shown here. But as ground-based astronomers, we also have to contend with a number of negative effects that Earth's atmosphere has on our astronomical observations. And one of those effects is what I call telluric absorption. That is absorption by molecules in Earth's atmosphere of starlight and galaxy light. Now across the optical and the infrared, telluric absorption looks like this. You can see there are discrete bands of absorption lines due to molecules like water and molecular oxygen and ozone and CO2 and methane. And then once you get long word of about half a micron, these absorption lines at some low level are really everywhere. But in the infrared, it becomes a really serious problem. There are actually very few windows that aren't heavily contaminated by one absorber or another. Now I think for extremely precise radio velocities, it's really water that we need to worry about. That's due in part to the fact that water lines are very, very numerous. The water lines are everywhere once you get past about half a micron in wavelength. The other issue is that the lines change in depth all the time. Those lines are organized roughly in bands, as you saw in the last plot. And within those bands, you get tens of lines per nanometer of spectrum having depths greater than 1%. This is what a sort of typical absorption spectrum for water at around 822 nanometers looks like at an observatory that's representative of an observatory in the desert southwest in North America. The lines have widths of about 0.01 nanometer, which means that they're nominally uh, resolved by a high-resolution astronomical spectrometer. And they have line shapes that are approximately Lorentzian. And that's because the water vapor in Earth's atmosphere is really constrained to lower levels where the pressure is relatively high. So they have Lorentzian line shapes. Now, if you were to zoom in, you would see that so-called microtellurics, that is lines that have depths of half a percent or quarter percent, they're really everywhere. These lines are very, very numerous in the optical. Now the water vapor in our atmosphere, as you know, changes all the time. Some days are drier, some days are, are wetter, and the result of that is that the absorption lines themselves are also changing in depth all the time. Here are two examples. These are observations of a hot featureless star, so you're only seeing the fingerprint of water absorption in our atmosphere here. And these two observations were taken relatively close in time, and you can just see with your eye that the amount of water vapor is changing a lot. So the strength of these water lines, they depend on air mass, of course, because that determines how much atmosphere you're looking through, but also what we call precipitable water vapor, which is measured in millimeters. So water varies a lot. The other species are relatively stable. The amount of water vapor in our atmosphere can change on rapid timescales. It can change within a night. This plot sh here shows you the distribution of change in the water column at Apache Point Observatory within one night. So it's very common for the amount of water vapor to change by a millimeter or so within a night. What does that mean? It means that sort of 25% changes in the water vapor line depths within a night are going to be very, very common. So right away you can see how this is going to be problematic. Right? We're observing a star at high spectral resolution through Earth's atmosphere, and we're hoping to measure infinitesimally small shifts in the centroids of those lines. Now, because Earth moves around the Sun, effectively the positions of the stellar lines are moving relative to the telluric lines. And then at the same time, those telluric lines are changing in depth. So it results in a very, very complicated mixing, which again, you could easily imagine can result in biased radial velocity measurements. It's a little simulation shown here. There have been a number of nice papers in the literature discussing this effect. Um, for example, one by Kunidal in 2014, considering observations of a sun-like star at fixed precipitable water vapor um, and different air masses. And here, the deepest water lines have already been masked out. And what these authors find is that depending on the barycentric velocity at the time of the observation, this can be more than a half meter a second effect in the optical, so a substantial effect. Uh, Sharon Wong collaborators recently had another nice paper looking specifically at the iodine cell region, so about 500 nanometers to 6200 nanometers. Um, and she tested out 
different strategies for dealing with the telluric water vapor, particularly the telluric water vapor that's around 590 nanometers. And she found that the impact of these lines is important when we, we seek to go below about one or two meters a second in this spectral region. And she also found that trying to model the tellurics to mitigate their impact was, was highly effective. We're going to talk about that in a bit. Here's a nice plot covering a wide range of wavelengths. These are simulations um, that Natasha Latouf carried out for the EarthFinder probe study. And here she's considering the situation if you do no mitigation at all. Just have the telurics in there and try to measure your rate of velocities. Now, perhaps not surprisingly, right, if you look at the telluric spectrum there shown in red at the bottom, it's not surprising that in infrared wavelengths, the whole thing basically falls apart. The telurics are imparting tens or hundreds of meters a second of uncertainty in your velocity measurements. But even mm -hmm. in the optical, as we're seeking to go towards lower and lower velocity precision, it really becomes possible, important to come up with some mitigation strategy for these telluric lines. So what are we going to do about it? I think there are four options that can be considered. One is nothing. So the telluric lines probably limit precision to say 50, meters, 50 centimeters a second in the optical, that is at wavelengths less than 600 nanometers, but probably meters a second in the red optical. And by that I mean say 700 to 900 nanometers. And that's unfortunate because that spectral range is extremely valuable for observations of low mass stars uh, that are particularly bright in that wavelength range. And I think it's safe to say that except for some tiny windows, say the Y band at just long word of, of one micron, PRVs in the infrared are probably not possible without doing something about the telluric lines. So the first thing you would try is to mask out the telluric lines during your RV analysis. This is a totally reasonable thing to do and has been proven highly effective in, in many situations. This is viable, I would say, in the optical, but probably problematic in the near infrared. And again, it's problematic in the near infrared just because there are so many of these lines. But one thing to keep in mind is that if you want to excise the entire portion of the stellar spectrum that is impacted by a given telluric line, it's about 0.1 nanometer of spectrum that needs to be masked for each telluric line. So you're actually losing quite a lot of spectrum. I do want to note that there are some nice discussions in the literature of much more optimal ways to do this masking. Um, but if you look here in this plot at the bottom, these are telluric lines greater than 1% have been masked out, and the width of those green regions corresponds to the barycentric motion of Earth. You can just see visually that you're losing a lot of spectrum. Option three might be to correct the spectra. This is an idea that I think goes way back in observational astronomy. You divide your stellar spectrum by some telluric model. That telluric model could be calculated, which we'll talk about in a minute, or it could be empirical. And by empirical, I just mean an actual observation of a hot featureless star taken close in time and at similar air mass to your stellar spectrum, your data. And an example of that is shown here. On the top, we have a spectrum that contains both stellar lines and telluric lines. In the middle, you have your uh, telluric spectrum, and then on the bottom, uh, that's your collect corrected stellar spectrum. Uh, just another example, using cryres data in the near-infrared, um, you can see that this method does a reasonably good job, um, but at the expense of observing time. So you're using your very, very valuable observing time not only to observe the stars you're interested in uh, for detecting exoplanets, but also a set of calibrators. Now the other thing you could do is you could calculate a telluric absorption spectrum. You could carry out a radiative transfer calculation. Um, the idea here is to start with a database of molecular line transition data. HITRAN is probably the most famous uh, example. You have a model of Earth's atmosphere which you've broken up into layers. And basically what you do is that you sum at each wavelength that you're calculating the cumulative optical depth from all the absorbing species at that wavelength. There are lots of great examples of, of these types of codes in the literature. For example, TAPAS, TerraSpec, LBL, RTM, TELFIT, MOLECFIT, and many others. And in these cases, the agreement is really quite good for moderate line depths. And here are some examples here. There have been some examples in the literature of situations where there are clearly telluric lines in the data that are not in the HITRAN database. 
Um, I'll talk about this again in a, in a couple of slides, um, but the most recent HITRAN databases, particularly for water, are, are very, very good. Here's another example, <clears throat> but this time I wanted to highlight that for very strong telluric lines or situations where you have a lot of, of water vapor, um, these in these, these calculated models tend to not be as good. An example on the top right here, you see you have water lines that are approaching saturation, optimal depths of close to uh, you know, very large numbers. Um, and you can see here that the agreement is not as good, and that's probably due in part to the fact that our modeling is not taking into account the details of the wing shapes of the line uh, very accurately. But I really wanted to emphasize here that high trend line values are very good and very close to complete for the line strengths we care about. So this idea that um, telluric models can't be calculated because the underlying molecular data is not good enough, it, it's not right. If you have a, a recent version of, of high trend, it's, it's very, very good. Now that's not to say that there aren't rare cases of water lines that are not in the high trend database, but we found that across the optical at, at line depths that we care about for our astronomical uh, applications, this is very rare. Another thing I wanted to point out um, is kind of an error, a mathematical error that's intrinsic to this entire approach. So imagine you have some data as a function of wavelength. That's the product of a stellar spectrum and a telluric spectrum convolved with the spectrograph LSF. Now I want to take my uh, data and I'm going to divide it by a telluric spectrum convolved with the spectrograph LSF. This is the basic correction approach. But mathematically, of course, that is not correct, right? The stellar spectrum convolved with the LSF is not equal to the data divided by your telluric spectrum. Now, this approximation is less bad at higher spectral re resolution. So if you're operating in the regime where the stellar lines and the telluric lines are well resolved, this is maybe not such a terrible assumption or approximation. But this approximation is also worse when the telluric line density is very high, for example, in the near infrared. And that's because you have many lines per unit of spectrum. Those lines will blend in very, very complicated ways, and any mathematical errors resulting uh, from this division will be amplified. So option four, I think, is a full-on forward model. You have a spectrum that contains stellar lines and telluric lines, and you're going to build up a model of the entire thing. There's been some very nice work in the literature on this recently. Uh, for example, Wobble is an empirical code by um, Fidel et al. in 2019. Uh, this is an example of an observation of 51 peg from her paper on the left, where you have the telluric model in blue, the stellar model, and the residuals. Uh, Ashley Baker recently... Uh, published a very nice semi-empirical model that is sort of like Wobble in that it is data-driven, but also includes quite a bit of physics about line shapes and information from high trend. Uh, these are very, very promising approaches that would enable you to simultaneously model the stellar spectrum, the telluric spectrum, and infer the radial velocity. But one limitation here is that these methods probably require, well, a lot of data. These are not methods that are probably going to work on a single observation of your star but also quite a wide coverage and barycentric velocity. And that's, again, to help separate out the stellar lines and the telluric lines. So I think this leaves us with three basic questions here. One is how to determine the spectrum of telluric water absorption in your ground-based stellar spectra. You could use theoretical models. You could use data-driven or machine learning approaches. Or you could use on-sky data, observations of hot stars. The next question, and I think perhaps the most important question, is what are you going to do with that information? Let's say I handed you a perfect telluric water model that goes with your observation of your favorite exoplanet host. What are you going to do with it? Are you going to try to correct the stellar spectrum in some way? Are you going to mask the telluric lines? Or are you just going to try to work in very clean atmospheric windows? And then finally, I think the third question is, should we be pursuing a sort of forward modeling overall approach? There's a lot of enthusiasm for this, uh, but it raises some questions. Is this computationally tractable? Um, what simplifications can we make to our underlying model while still getting, getting good radial velocity precision? And I wanted to leave you with some takeaways. One is that 
there's a lot of knowledge and data out there related to both molecular transitions and Earth's atmosphere that we can and should be using. We should try to interface with the communities who are studying Earth's atmosphere for other reasons. For example, studying telluric CO2 absorption to try to understand uh, global warming. And I also wanted to emphasize again that the HITRAN database is expected to be essentially complete and accurate for water lines at the intensities we care about. So this is a plot that shows telluric, uh, well, water lines from HITRAN as a function of wavelength versus line strength on the y-axis. And I've highlighted here that in these units, 10 to the minus 25 is approximately a 1% line at your sort of uh, you know, standard uh, 3,000 meter high astronomical observatory. These are considered quite strong lines, actually, uh, for the HITRAN database, and they're relatively well studied. So you have to use the most recent versions of HITRAN, um, but if you do that, you should be in good shape. And I also wanted to mention that HITRAN is constantly being updated, so check back. There's lots of enthusiasm for these full-up modeling approaches like Wobble, um, but I think we also want to think about hybrid approaches involving both an empirical approach but also some physics-based modeling, taking advantage of all this knowledge that our colleagues in other subfields have about Earth's atmosphere and molecular transitions. But I think it's an open question is how well these uh, techniques extend out into the near infrared. In the optical, you're operating in the regime where because of barycentric motion, some stellar lines are sometimes going to fall on telluric lines and sometimes they won't. But in the near infrared, you're kind of in a different regime where the stellar lines are sort of never separated out from the tellurics. The tellurics are everywhere. It's fundamentally a much harder problem. There's also a lot of interest in completely empirical approaches, sort of data-driven approaches. Uh, for example, when I talked about how these telluric models are generated from the radiative transfer point of view, I described adding up optical depth as a function of wavelength for all the different absorbing species you care about. Well, that really sounds, at least to me, like something that can be addressed using principal component analysis. Uh, the Spiru team has had a, a lot of success, I think, using approaches like these um, and have produced some, some really nice corrections for the Spiru infrared radial velocity data. Um, one question I think we want to think about here is are linear models in optical depth really sufficient uh, in the near infrared where we're dealing with uh, lines that span a wide range of absorption strengths. Another nice example of kind of a data-driven empirical approach was a paper in 2019 by Lee et al. called Selenite. This is a linear code uh, to derive telluric templates from a set of stellar observations. It's fast, it's totally empirical, it naturally handles different absorbing species. So I think there's a lot of enthusiasm for these types of, uh, these types of approaches. The problem is much harder in the near infrared, right? So here is a bit of the app, SDSS Apogee spectral range. And you can see that you have water from, you have absorption from water, CO2, and methane, and these things all overlap. The water and the methane lines are relatively isolated from each other. They're separated. The CO2 lines are packed very densely together. So you have multiple species, high line density. You have complicated line mixing between the CO2. And unlike for water, for methane and CO2, the line lists in HITRAN are not necessarily as good, plus you have strong sky emission. So in the near infrared, I think this is a fundamentally more difficult problem. For me, I feel a sense of optimism when I read about how to deal with telluric absorption and EPRV measurements. I think people feel like this problem should mm -hmm. be solvable. And that's in part because there's lots of well-understood physics here related to Earth's atmosphere and also molecular transitions. And there are a whole array of sophisticated analysis techniques, such as uh, the fancy PCA techniques or the full-on forward modeling, that we're really just starting to explore. I want to remind you that tellurics have been part and parcel of the EPRV game from really the start. This is one of the first mentions, I think, in the literature of trying to measure the velocity of a star to meters a second from 1973. And here, Griffin and Griffin were proposing actually using telluric oxygen lines as a simultaneous wavelength reference. Um, and now, in 2020, we're talking about trying to essentially mitigate the impacts of these lines so that we can achieve radial velocity precisions of 100 or more times better. So in conclusions, 
In conclusion, I think it's fair to say that telluric lines may be a leading source of systematic RV error in the optical once we go below 50 centimeters a second, and it's at least meters a second in some regions of the near infrared. But we do have tools at our disposal to deal with this problem. And I think given all of the talented students and postdocs who are working on this topic, and you saw in the references in my talk, there are many very recent references from 2018 and 2019, I fully expect this problem to be solved, hopefully before I retire. So thanks very much, and um, happy to answer questions.